Hello, my name is Rachel Kang, and today I'm going to be presenting on the utility of machine learning in assessing suicide risk, a meta-analysis. This analysis was completed as part of my master's thesis at the Rochester Institute of Technology. During my presentation, I will also be mentioning some tools that were used in this analysis that will hopefully aid you in your research endeavors in the future. Before diving into the methodologies and results of the thesis, I wanted to take a brief moment to talk about suicide, suicidality, and machine learning. Suicide is an act in which a person is successfully able to take their own life. As you can see on this slide, current rates of suicide show that suicide is a very prevalent and unfortunately very persisting event that affects people of all ages worldwide. Current methods of suicide risk assessment, such as measures and clinical interviews, look for the presence of a series of risk factors that have been validated through previous research. Risk factors such as the presence of a mental illness, the presence of a major life-changing event, socioeconomic statuses, presence of suicidal ideation or suicidal self-injury, and presence of non-suicidal self-injury. However, in a recent meta-analysis conducted by Franklin and colleagues that was published in 2017, there were presented some concerning findings about these suicide risk factors that we have come to know now and brought up this question, should we be pivoting from these risk factors? Namely, the results from the meta-analysis conducted by Franklin and colleagues was that these known risk factors of suicide may have a predictive accuracy of no better than chance. Specifically, in this abstract snippet, we see the authors present two major points. Predictive ability has not improved across 50 years of research, and findings suggest the need for a shift in the focus from risk factors to machine-based learning algorithms. Why is this? Well, in this study, as well as in a study conducted by Linthicum and colleagues in 2019, researchers suggested that these traditional models of suicide assessment may oversimplify the complex nature of suicide because our construct of suicide risk is too oversimplified. Now, this, this isn't anyone's fault or error or wrongdoing. This was something that was done in order to try and understand a multidimensional model in a way that could be assessed in a simple and direct way via interview or assessment scale. The thing is, if we want to better our predictive abilities in our assessments and in our interviews, then we need to better understand suicide as a whole. And we need to find a method to model suicide in a way that fully appreciates that complex and multidimensional nature. And that method may be machine learning. Now, what is machine learning? Machine learning is a broad umbrella that encompasses many different types of algorithms used for prediction and classification. One of the hallmark characteristics of machine learning is its ability to handle and analyze incredibly complex data in order to, for example, make classifications. Um, this is particularly useful for diagnoses or predictions. We see that machine learning has already made substantial headway into healthcare. A machine learning algorithm that was developed by Epic Systems is currently being used to predict sepsis in patients in hospitals uh, in, around America. Randomized controlled clinical trials using this system have shown that the implementation has decreased rates of sepsis seen in hospitals where the system was implemented, as well as reduced the number of deaths due to sepsis in these hospitals. Furthermore, in individual studies of machine learning and suicide risk prediction, machine learning has already shown high rates of accuracy in suicide prediction up to and even beyond 30 days from the event. In this study, I wanted to assess the impact of machine learning on suicide risk assessment through a meta-analytic review. Further, I wanted to explore any potential moderators that could potentially affect the effect of machine learning on suicide risk prediction. This study was conducted using the PRISMA method. 
this method's validity has been researched and validated and the results are free to access on the Prisma website through a very quick Google search. On this website, you can find tools such as checklists and tips that are all freely available to researchers to use when conducting such analyses. On this slide, I included information about the inclusionary and exclusionary criteria for the articles that were included in the analyses, as well as the search terms and databases that were scoured for the articles. Specifically, I would like to highlight that I defined suicide risk in this study as an individual having committed or attempted suicide. And this was to differentiate between studies that predicted suicide attempt or death and studies that predicted presence of suicidal ideation or self-injury. This distinction was made following the guidelines published in an article by Posner and colleagues in 2007, whereby the authors validated a categorization scheme for suicidal events that is currently being utilized by the FDA. Here we have a flow diagram of the article screening process. We began with an initial 1,044 articles. 586 articles were excluded in the title and abstract screening phase, and an additional 194 articles were excluded in the full text review screening phase. 70 articles were left to be included in the analyses. However, during data extraction, it was noted that there was one article that reported an effect size of Hedges G equal to 5.57. After consulting with a key opinion leader in the field, it was decided that this effect size, when taking into account the other effect sizes in the rest of the data, was improbable. And because of this, um, the article was excluded from the final analysis, bringing the total number of articles included to 69. Data extraction was conducted using Covidence a tool that is available to enhance the meta-analytic process following the PRISMA method. Now, I would like to preface that Covidence is not a free tool like the PRISMA method online or like R, <clears throat> but I personally felt as though this tool was worth investing the money in as I was able to complete this analysis uh, within a three semester long master's thesis program. And I feel like it very much enhanced my experience doing these analyses and doing this research. Covidence allows you to edit and customize your codebook. And it also has a querying process that will automatically highlight discrepancies between or among raters in both the article exclusion phases and in the data extraction phases in order to expedite rater consolidation. Here is just a little list of the data extracted in these analyses. Looking at the descriptive statistics of the effect sizes, we see that in the 69 articles included, these studies contributed a total of 286 effect sizes. Now this indicates that there was a significant amount of nesting within the data. We see that one study contributed 24 effect sizes, one study contributed 16, another one 15, and so on. And this subsequently affected the type of model uh, chosen to run. All analyses were conducted in R, which is a free statistical programming software. Um, packages required to run these statistics and other very powerful statistics are free to use and easy to implement. And there are many resources online that can teach you how to use R and communities where you can pose questions and crowdsource solutions to those questions. We converted all AUCs into hedges Gs because meta-analytic techniques are better developed for pooling standardized mean differences. We also used a mixed effects multi-level model to account for variances found in fixed and random effects models, as well as the significant nesting that was observed in the data. Following PRISMA methods for meta-analyses, tests of heterogeneity were performed using sigma values and Cochrane's Q. 
Further, meta-regressions were conducted to examine the impact of moderating variables. There were three moderators that were selected to be these moderating variables. Um, they were data source type, uh, where the data was acquired, such as a national registry or a university hospital, the definition of suicide, or how the researchers in the articles defined a suicide event, um, did they use an assessment tool? Did they use DSM or ICD standards? As well as the algorithm family as the last moderating variable and algorithm family just referring to the type of algorithm that was used in the research. Reference standards for each variable were the ensemble methods for algorithm type, university hospital data for data source, and the ICD for suicide definition. And here are just a summary of the descriptive statistics for these different moderator variables. Moving into the results section. In our overall model, we found significant heterogeneity of effect sizes. Despite this, however, we see that the ICC of the true effect size was medium to large, and the average effect size pooled across all studies was large and statistically significant. When we take into account the fully augmented model with the moderators entered, we see that this model accounted for a significant amount of the variance. The ICC of the true effect size was large at 0.8, as was the average effect size with a hedges G of 1.63. We see that within study variance is decreased by 0.01 and between study variance is decreased by 0.09. However, overall, there is still significant heterogeneity within this model, uh, which could indicate that there were variances that existed that weren't accounted for by the predictors that were entered into the model. When we looked at the omnibus models of the moderators, results indicated that there were significant differences among the subgroups of the moderator variables. Specifically, we're going to take a look at the algorithm type meta regression because this was the only model that returned a significant result. These results indicated that the type of algorithm used had a significant impact on the accuracy of the machine's ability to predict suicide risk. Now, within these models, there were certain subgroups that performed better than the reference standard of ensemble methods, which was deep learning. There were also other models that performed worse than the ensemble method reference standard, and these two were Bayesian and regression methods. However, in two slides, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, deep learning and why we may have seen these results of deep learning being potentially a better predictor of suicide risk than the ensemble methods. Once again, following PRISMA methods for meta-analyses, publication biases um, were Publication bias analyses were conducted using Eggers regression test. Results suggested little evidence of publication biases and adjusting for these only improved the results slightly. Now, what does all of this mean clinically? To provide more clinically meaningful insights, the predicted values from the meta regression using algorithm type as the moderator were converted into an estimated AUC. When we converted the effect size of ensemble methods, which was the most reported and seemingly most accurate algorithm for prediction, we got an AUC of approximately 0.8, which shows good classification accuracy. Kind of switching back to deep learning. Now, deep learning was the only subgroup that performed significantly better than the ensemble methods in terms of accuracy and predicting suicide risk. But when we look at this funnel plot for deep learning, we see that 
there may be evidence of publication biases in that most of the articles published had very high effect sizes, whereas only two articles published showed low effect sizes. When looking at these studies, the studies that were published that had high effect sizes had effect sizes that averaged around 0.89. Uh, as Youngstrom and colleagues described, however, in an article published in 2019, these kinds of AUCs, AUCs that approach and go beyond 0.9, should be considered a little suspicious. They're almost too good to be true, taking a direct quote from the article. And this altogether could indicate that deep learning may not be better at predicting suicide than ensemble methods, or maybe not as better as these results indicated in this study. However, further analysis is warranted to ascertain the statement um, that go beyond what I conducted in this project. Conclusions and closing remarks. Based on the results of the meta-analysis, we see that machine learning has a significant effect on the prediction of suicide risk. When delving into the moderators, the type of algorithm used had a significant impact on return to accuracy reports. When we look inside the model of algorithm family, ensemble methods had one of the highest accuracies reported. It was also one of the most frequently used method of machine learning. However, there's a little caveat to remember when talking about ensemble methods in machine learning. Ensemble methods is a kind of umbrella term that describes an algorithm that is composed of several different machine learning techniques in order to decrease variance and bias while increasing classification abilities. So for example, a very popular ensemble method that is used is called random forest. Random forest, however, is just the combination of multiple decision tree algorithms. It, it could be as few as five or 10, it could be as many as hundreds or thousands. Ensemble methods are kind of akin to conglomerate rocks, where a conglomerate rock is a single rock that is made up of many different rocks that have been fused together. Coming up to the end of this presentation, there are two final comments that I would like to make. Firstly, to my knowledge, there has not been to date a meta-analytic review of this topic published. And then secondly, uh, I would like to touch again upon the tools that I use to conduct these analyses as they can be a great asset for researchers in their future projects. I use the PRISMA method for the meta-analytic reviews which is a free tool that is online for researchers to access in order to conduct standardized meta-analytic reviews. There are great tools and worksheets that provide a lot of great structure for these analyses and can really enhance your experience conducting meta-analyses. For statistical analyses, I utilized R, which is a very powerful and free tool that can be used to conduct a whole slew of different statistical analyses. Um, there is also the ability to share the code using notebooks in order to collaborate with other researchers or students. And there is a crowdsource movement that is continuously making new statistical packages that is expanding the ability of R's statistical test repertoire. And then finally, talking about Covidens once again, it's not a free tool, unlike Prisma and R, but it is a very helpful tool that is available to researchers. And if it is available to you through a university or through a grant or something of that nature, I would seriously consider investing the money to use this tool as I feel it would greatly enhance and expedite your project and endeavors conducting a meta-analysis. I would like to give special thanks to my master's thesis committee at RIT 
as well as HGAPS for helping me with this research. Thank you for listening to my talk and feel free to contact me if you have any further questions or comments. Using the QR code on the screen, you can access these PowerPoint slides as well as the thesis paper. Uh, thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or evening.